Hi, AP Line. Um, this is Mr. Roman, and we're going to talk about cognitive dissonance theory today. Uh, this is Tuesday, March 31st. Well, it will be when you're watching this. Um, before you watch this, if you haven't already, please check out the YouTube video I posted in Blackboard immediately above this. That's a Khan Academy video that will give you a little bit of perspective about cognitive dissonance theory. Um, and then we're going to, this is going to go into a little more detail and also just give you some perspective as to, you know, what, how we would apply, you know, why we're talking about this and how we would apply that theory in AP Lang specifically. Um, so, um, I hope yesterday you had, uh, a good time watching the, uh, AP, the College Board video. Um, there will be more of those webinars out and we will be, some of our assignments moving forward will be to watch some of those. Um, and later this week is when we'll get some more information about the AP testing and what that's exactly going to look like this year. So, let's just dive into cognitive dissonance theory. So before we even talk about it, and this is something the video left out, so I thought it was important to talk about, we need to talk about some key terms that surround cognitive dissonance theory specifically. Um, so, you know, first we have cognition, which is just bits of knowledge. These are the things that we think about, that we act on, that they're the, just the little pieces of information and knowledge that float around in our brain. We'll sometimes activate those bits of knowledge, and other times we won't, and that's okay as well. Um, we also have consonants. So that's when we have harmony between our ideas and our thoughts. So, you know, when we have an idea, we have a piece of cognition floating around our brain and we get a new piece of cognition, then if there's consonants, it means that we found a way to create harmony between those ideas and those thoughts. So if I am a fan of a specific politician, um, let's say, right, you know, thinking about the Democratic primary, let's say I'm a supporter of Joe Biden, and I see that Joe, you know, the former Vice President Joe Biden is winning right now, is leading the delegate race, getting some positive messages, I'm going to get some consonants about that. Um, you know, and that's going to create, there's, that's going to be a good thing, because we like to live in a state of consonants. We really don't like the discomfort of our last term here, which is dissonance. Um, and so dissonance is deter our disturbances between ideas and thoughts and pieces of cognition. So, you know, going back to the example I just had, so let's say, um, you know, going into Super Tuesday, let's say that I am a Bernie Sanders, Senator Bernie Sanders supporter. Well, seeing that he is not performing well, I have to decide what is it that I'm going to do now? What am I going to do moving forward? How might that change my vote if I haven't voted yet? Um, you know, or, you know, if you have a, a favorite athlete, right, a favorite, a favorite sports star, and you hear that they've done something not so good, whether that be maybe they've taken performance enhancing drugs, maybe they have, um, you know, thinking like Tiger Woods, maybe he hasn't been faithful in his marriage and, and is, you know, engaged in other illicit or illegal or immoral behavior. Well, now we have to determine how we're going to handle that because we don't want to continue to live in this area of dissonance. We want to live in a state of consonance. And so living in that state of dissonance can really, can really impact us. <laughs> so cognition, you know, different pieces of cognition fit together to, for us to either build consonants or dissonant, or it becomes dissonance. And then we try to make sure that we don't have that dissonance anymore moving forward. So here's the definition of cognitive dissonance theory. When new information is introduced, our drive is to reduce, but not eliminate dissonance. When new information is introduced, our drive is to reduce, but not eliminate dissonance. Give you a second to write that down. So, the key element here is that we're trying to reduce dissonance. We're never going to be able to completely eliminate it. It's always going to be there, but we can do, we can take actions to make sure that we are giving ourselves a fighting chance at ending, at, at not feeling that discomfort, not feeling that cognitive discomfort, because we're going to get information that goes against 
our attitudes and beliefs and behaviors all the time, but it's about making sure that when we get that information, we have some ways to handle it. We have some ways to reduce that dissonance because we may not be able to eliminate it. Part of us may always know that, uh, that what something that we're doing isn't right based on this new information, but we also wanna make sure that we're at least justifying our own behaviors and our own attitudes and beliefs and et cetera. So reducing dissonance, there are a few ways that we can reduce dissonance. So the first one is we can change one or more of our attitudes, beliefs, behaviors, et cetera, to make the relationship between the two elements a consonant one. So what that means is let's say, for example, um, that I have a pretty negative attitude towards, um, let's go back a few years. Let's say I, I previously had a pretty negative attitude towards Domino's Pizza. And a few years back, it's been a, a more than a few years now, Domino's kind of re started reinventing itself. And one of the things it did was it changed the recipe behind its crust specifically. Um, and so let's say I had a pretty negative attitude towards that, but now I'm hearing that they've changed they've changed what they do. We, I have a whole new product here. I'm still gonna have a pretty negative attitude, but maybe I'll shift it to saying, well, I'll give it a try, right? Maybe I don't have that negative attitude as much anymore um, to make the relationship a consonant one. The same thing can happen in reverse. You know, if you go to a restaurant, this happens to my dad a lot. He dislikes, he, my parents really like eating at Chili's, but my dad really dislikes how often they change their menu and how they'll often eliminate menu items that were favorites of his. So, you know, at first he'll go through this, you know, he won't change his behavior of going there, but what he will do, um, he, what he will do is he will in fact give some type of um, justification as to, you know, why he'll still go there, right? He might, he has to, you know, maybe he'll find a new favorite item. And even though he doesn't like it that they change their menu, he likes the new menu item and therefore he'll still go there and he won't change his behavior. So those are just a couple of different ways that we can reduce that dissonance. Um, I think beliefs are probably the hardest way. It's hard to change our beliefs. So maybe we change our attitude around a belief. Um, because, you know, remember attitudes are kind of how we feel about something where beliefs are what, what's at the core of us as a human being. Um, and behaviors are obviously just what we do. The second one, it, second way to reduce dissonance is to acquire new information that outweighs the dissonant belief. So what that means is that we go out and find additional information. Now, this additional information may not be good information. It may be information that just feeds into our existing belief. Or maybe we go out and seek out enough information that it does actually lead to us changing what we believe in what we think so you know for example um let's say i really dislike a specific politician like let's say i really really dislike um i really dislike i really dislike senator bernie sanders and i get this new information that well he's got these plans that actually i'm i'm in support of you know maybe i like the idea of medicare for all or i like the idea of um free college, especially as I'm getting ready to go pay for college, right? Well, so I, I hear these plans, um, and, I, and those plans are different than maybe if I am a Joe Biden supporter, you know, okay, well, we've got these different, um, we've got these different plans in place. So now the question becomes, okay, well, what do I do? So you go out and do some research, you find more information, and maybe you'll find more information that makes you actually change who you support, or maybe you, you will find some new information that will just reinforce your existing belief. But either way, you go out and seek information. Um, a lot of times, we unfortunately will go seek information from news sources that will tell us what we want to hear. Um, you know, think if I'm, you know, for avid cable news watchers, if I'm an MSNBC viewer, I'll watch that, CNN, watch that, Fox News, watch that. But, the, but we're still acquiring additional and new information to make that happen. And then the last thing is reduce the importance of the cognition. So those beliefs, attitudes, behaviors, etc. So maybe we will, you know, we get this new information and something that was previously really important to us, we won't get value as, as important anymore. Or maybe even if we get this information from a trusted source, this new information that introduces dissonance, 
maybe we'll just say, well, we'll find a way to discredit the source. So, um, you know, uh, I read an article that says that I shouldn't eat red meat. Well, okay, who wrote the article? Oh, well, they're just some random doctor. They're not, they don't really have any credibility. So I'm, I'm not as concerned now, right? Those are the different kinds of things that in, in thought processes that we often will go through um, to make those things happen. So those are, those are just different things to keep in mind and in different ways that we, um, that we actually will go about reducing that dissonance on the whole. So we either will change one of our existing attitudes, beliefs, behaviors, etc. We'll acquire additional information or we'll reduce the importance of that cognition, whether that's the new information or the existing information that we have. So this is obviously kind of a big theory. It's been around since the 1950s, 1957 as when Leon Festinger uh, originally introduced it. So it's why is this important to AP Lang? Well, we need to be able to know our own attitudes and, be, and beliefs, right? We need to make sure that we are aware of our atti own attitudes and beliefs and even behaviors as we go into reading something. Because while we may not know exactly which task you're going to be asked to, um, asked to go through for the AP Lang exam, one of the things that we do know is that, um, one of the things we do know is you're going to be asked to evaluate something, right? Either you're going to be asked to evaluate uh, a short reading passage in front of you, several short passages in front of you, or even here's just a really short prompt and you're going to need to be able to evaluate different perspectives to make an argument on that. And so we really need to be objective evaluators of information. And that's really key in AP Line. We have to be able to look at what's in front of us and objectively, objectively evaluate. And then once we have objectively evaluated the information, at the end of the day, we still have to take a position. It's all about making an argument. At the end of the day, that's exactly what we have to do is we have to make an argument. And so when we take that position, we have to make sure that we're not letting our own biases come into play, that we're taking the best position based on the information that's in front of us. So what I'm saying is, yeah, you may have to write an essay for the AP Lang exam or even sometime in the future where you have the best evidence for, but it's not actually the position that you are most in support of. And that's okay because I'm not asking you to do that when the stakes are high. I'm asking you to do that when you know you have a specific position. And it's also a healthy thing to try to figure out the perspectives of other people and, and take positions that are different from the ones that you would normally take. So that way you can absolutely see, okay, where are they coming from? Where's the other side coming from? And remember, you know, with the exception of the rhetorical analysis task, you need to introduce some type of counter argument and you need to refute that counter argument. And that refutation of that counter argument is, is very important. So um, at this point, um, it, I have a discussion board now below. I've given you an example. I want everyone to make a post um, where you think about where does cognitive dissonance and how does cognitive dissonance impact you in your life? And as a result of that, you're going to then um, it, it reply to some of your peers too to see how, how they um, handle that. So you're going to post what the topic is, why that's a topic, how it plays out, how you reduce that dissonance, um, and then respond to a couple of your peers. So that's what's on task for today. I uh, will see you soon.